Hello, I'm Ken Gergen, and I've been asked to come here today to talk about social construction. And actually, there's nothing I'd rather do. I've been involved with social constructionist theory, practices, implications for, well, let's say over 25 years. And it's still as exciting today as it was for me 20, 25 years ago. And part of that excitement is because these ideas and the implications and practices that have grown out of them basically at this point travel the globe. And I can be in Delhi, I could be in Kyoto, Japan, I could be in South Africa, I could be in Buenos Aires, Argentina, or Helsinki, Finland, and still have the same kinds of conversations with the same edge, the same sort of exciting implications, everyone wanting to talk, everyone wanting to be in dialogue, because a lot hangs on it. Many people feel that, in fact, possibly the future of global condition depends a great deal on how we can take in and absorb these ideas and use them. Now, that's a tall order, and I don't know whether I can make good on that in one day, one half hour, however it is I'm going to talk today, but let's see where we can go. Now, it's really important to realize that social construction as a theory, as a set of ideas, doesn't belong to any single person. It's not my theory. It is a group of ideas that have come together to form a mixture, a compound, out of which new dialogues spring and new conditions and new, new conversations emerge. So that, in fact, one can try to freeze those conversations at a given point, but you're going to fail. And by the way, this is also to say that because it's not fixed and not frozen, that you, as viewer, are invited into the conversation. You, too, could be part of the conversation, which pushes into the next level. You should also realize that as exciting as these ideas are, they're enormously controversial. They unsettle a lot of ideas about things like truth, objectivity, value neutrality, the self, and so on. So realize that as I talk about these ideas, they're going to seem fairly obvious is the way I'm going to put it, but a lot hangs on it. So be careful, and perhaps we can come back to how, why this controversy in a few minutes. Let me try to make this clear by simply laying out a set of very simple propositions that for many people lie somewhere close to the center of social construction. Not all would agree on every one of these propositions. But let's try them out, because so, this will certainly get you into the center of what this is all about. There's a first proposition. Whatever there is makes no requirements about how we talk about it, how we characterize it, how we depict it. That is to say, for example, whatever this is makes no demands on us about what language we use, how we characterize it, and so on. We could talk about it as a lot of different things. We could use nonsense syllables to talk about it. We could talk about it as Charlie. We could talk about it as a bottle of water, but that's optional. Okay. Now, watch that. I mean, that seems simple enough, doesn't it? But be careful because most of the world's peoples today will want to center in on something which this is, and that is what is true about it. That is, there's a strong tendency to delimit and narrow the range of what it is we could call that. Now, let's go on to a second proposition. Whatever it is that I do call this, however it is I characterize it, will not be demanded by the, what we'll call the thing in itself, but will grow from a set of relationships in which I'm involved, some kind of tradition, some sort of community of which I'm a part. Thus, you and I, in our sort of daily life, will call that a water bottle, a bottle of water, no problem. And we would look at that as kind of a solid object. Now, there's no, in the terms of, let's say, physics, if you were part of that community, there is no technical thing called a water bottle. 
It's just not a label in physics, and that would not be a solid. If we were to approach this, let's say, from the standpoint of chemistry, still there would be no bottle of water technically, that's a humdrum day-to-day -day term. What we would be interested in is the chemical composition of that, and what is it in the interior, the liquid, and that which it's contained in. It would be a whole language into itself, a whole language that is used by that community to do something with that object. If I were an art historian, I might be interested in this as a quintessential modernist production. That is, the particular design feature of this comes out of a tradition which is probably 80 to 90 years old. If you designed that particular object, well, you wouldn't have the plastic, but if you designed something to be a bottle, let's say 150 years ago, it would have a quite different style. So that becomes an object for me in art history as a modernist design. Now, if I were an environmentalist, hmm, uh, that becomes a degradation to our environment. It, it bears a carbon footprint that would suggest that this is an abomination. Why do we need plastics? Why do we need to import water from far distances? Why do we need to have water, which is probably not very different from what we drink out of a tap in any case? So it simply becomes another thing. So in effect, what this is grows into being what it is for us out of some kind of community. Now ask yourself this. We can look at that, we can apprehend it, we can take it into account from many different perspectives. But if you abandon all the perspectives, what can you say about it? Nothing. So in effect, everything that is real for us, that is, which demands our attention for us, comes out of some kind of communal relationship. Now I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, but it's terribly important. Another way to say that is that we socially construct this for what it is. Now, a third proposition, very closely related. Whatever construction I make of that, whatever perspective I take on it, is going to bear something that we'll call values. That is, there is no value neutral construction of that. There's no value-neutral description of the world. Because each one of these terms that I've used from these various, from physics, from chemistry, from environmentalism, and so on, and for us in daily life, carries with it something we want to do with it, something which it's valuable for or not valuable for. Um, if we want to reconstruct this material, we'd like to know the chemical composition. If we want to re if we want to make sure of the purity of that, whatever the liquid is, we want to know the chemical composition. That is our value, and that will lead us to describe it in certain ways as opposed to others. If we're an environmentalist, we have certain values which lead us to call this an abomination or lead us to look at it in terms of its carbon footprint that it's bearing. And similarly, if we could conceivably generate, why not, a form of religion in which that could be a holy object. We could construct it that way. And it would be value for, uh, valuable for us because of, it, of its sacred properties. We could bring it into worship service. We could bathe one in it to, um, at a baptism ceremony. So in effect, all descriptions will carry with them certain kinds of ways of life certain sorts of things that we like to do with this as opposed to others. Now, this doesn't mean that anything goes with respect to what this is. Clearly not, because once you're in a community, there are only certain things that will go and not others. If we worship it, we're not going to call it an abomination. It also means that we could, in science, have things 
have carry out practices of prediction and control of that. That is, for example, in the one a desire to recreate that liquid elsewhere in chemical form. But in order to do that, in order to make predictions of that kind, in order to have a science, we have to have agreements. That is, we have to have communal agreements that we're going to call this, let's say, that we're going to have certain kinds of things that we're going to call chemical elements, and we're going to agree on what they are, and that's what we're going to agree on the assays we make of, or the descriptions we make, or the ways in which we study it, let's say, the apparatus that we'll use to make studies. And within that community, we can do things like predict. But realize that because science makes predictions, that doesn't mean that the terms of science are true. It doesn't mean they're objective. It doesn't mean they're required by the nature of the object. That is, they're just terms that are used within a certain tradition of agreement, which allows you to do things like make predictions. If that's not your goal, if your goal is to have, let's say, a refreshing drink, um, then there are other, way, other languages that you'd want to have for that. <clears throat> so in effect, within a community, one can have certain kinds of, then ha can have a science in which truth can be declared, but realize it's true with a small t. Um, one piece of the background of this, which is very helpful at this point, is the work of a 20th century Austrian philosopher, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. <clears throat> Wittgenstein, part of the, his importance, falls from the notion of there is no descriptive language. That is, language doesn't get its meaning from what there is, which we've already said in a certain way. But what Wittgenstein offers as an alternative, <clears throat> and it's implied in what I've said so far, is that the meaning of any kind of word is generated within what we call a language game. That is, we can say certain things and not, depending on the agreements we make about how we talk. Okay? In a basic way, let's say we have simply rules of grammar, but we also have words that fit only within certain sentences and not within others. I can't say, for example, that my, I feel the emotion of squaredom not because squaredom isn't real, but because what does that mean? It doesn't fit into any language game we know. I say I can say I feel angry or I feel happy, no problem, but squaredom doesn't fit, not because it does again, because it's not a good reading of whatever it is I might be feeling, but because that's not a way we have of talking. So you can look at, let's say, physics and chemistry and environmentalism and psychology and sociology, political science and so on, in a sense as representing different kinds of language games. And for Wittgenstein, these language games are built into what he called forms of life. That is, they're not just games of words, what you can say. They're also things you can do. As I can have a let's say, in baseball, I could have um, the truth about whether something was a foul ball or not, in the same way I could know whether it was, whether objects fall at a certain speed to the earth, or whether there are witches. And I could have it right in baseball about what is a foul, primarily because it agrees with a certain kind of form of life, that is, the game of baseball, which includes players, home plates, bats, balls, gloves, and so on. So each form of life, then, contains a world, contains its own values within that world. Okay. Now, if you get these three propositions, you can then begin to move out and say, well, look, um, isn't that, doesn't that suggest that everything that we hold to be real, everything that's true for us, everything that seems absolutely clear, 
the day-to-day -day common sense realities, the great realities of science, of religion, and so on, everything that we stand for, everything that's worth getting up for in the morning, this is valuable, no, that's valuable, what I really want to do with my life comes out of some kind of relational background, not from in here, not from some kind of thing that I have brought into the world, but from whom I'm talking with, who I'm relating to, who I love, who I care for, who cares for me, what my reputation is, how we get along together, so that relationship become enormously important, become a centerpiece for most constructionists as something to care for, something to look at, something to take into account as fundamental. Now, I've got to add one more piece to this because it will prove important in a moment. <clears throat> and it, you might say it's a proposition which says, nothing I've said so far is true. That is, nothing I've said so far is an accurate picture, map, account of what is the case. It may seem that way, and I may have talked that way, but from a constructionist standpoint, Clearly, I have constructed this. It's a way of talk. So we're not out to sort of prove the truth of or the objectivity of social construction. It's more a way of orienting in life. It's more of a way of approaching all declarations, all ways of life as thrown constructions by people in relationship which have certain kinds of embedded values. <clears throat> it's not a belief system not saying uh, you are a constructionist or not a constructionist. Again, it's a way of talking, it's a way of writing. It's a resource that can be used or not used. And most uh, parts of every day, you might say I'm a realist, not a constructionist. That is, I talk in terms of the bottle of water. <clears throat> that is, I don't question that every moment. I'm not a constructionist trying to say, well, that's an interesting construction. What way of life does that represent and so on? But it's a resource that I can use and, and in fact will invite an enormous amount of creativity. For example, <clears throat> death. Now, constructionism isn't saying death is not real or not unreal. Constructionism makes no basic statements about what there is. But the way in which, at least in the West, we have now come largely to believe, not exclusively, but it's a biological ending. And for certain purposes, that's a useful way of looking at what happens that we call death. But it also carries certain kinds of values because it begins to suggest that whatever that was is finished, gone, and so on. Let's get on with life. That's just the end, period. Now that's okay up to a point, but it's a very impoverished way of looking at death. That is, it's a, it begins to close down on all sorts of alternative constructions that one might make of it, all sorts of other traditions which might have different and more enriching, more uplifting ways of looking at what has happened. Is it a transition to another state? Will one come back in another state? Is it part of a great evolutionary move and so on? Is it move, a movement to some other space, some other time? Um, as one adds lamination, to the concept of death, that is, opens it up, it begins, we can do many other things. For example, I have a friend who says, look, it's a problem that we look at people as having, their lives as having been finished, because in certain respects we carry their lives. They are part of us. Their language is part of us. Their ways of life inhabit us. We carry them. In fact, we stay alive we keep them alive through us. Now, that's a rather wonderful way of looking at death, but it requires that you put some constraints over the biological view and say, well, that's a construction, but there could be others. Nor need we to devalue death. 
That is, we can begin to ask, would we want to, for example, expand the lifespan indefinitely? Would we really want to do that? Would we want everyone living to 200? What kind of sustainable world would that be? Okay, now you can begin to see some of the controversies here. That is, many people have staked their lives on something being of, of discriminating between what's true and false, about object of developing objective knowledge, of approximating what is truth, of spending a life in science to try to reach the truth, and so on. Or you can look at the whole Western tradition of the individual where the self is the center, where me as a, an autonomous agent <clears throat> are the center, and where a relationship is formed by separate selves. And constructionism begins to raise questions about all those views. Enormous heat goes on in that. And so, or again, take the, the view of value. What is valuable? Many people want to have foundational ethics where this is valuable and some things are not valuable and some cultures and some people stand for things which I find immoral. <clears throat> Constructionism doesn't, seems to recognize the possibility for multiple moralities, none of which could declare themselves superior. Now that makes for a lot of heated debate. Most of that debate uh, is ill-conceived. <clears throat> Because again, it falls back on this traditional way we have of, of talking with each other, which says, it's my truth against your truth. <clears throat> that if constructionism is true, then truth goes out the window. If constructionism is true, objectivity or neutrality or science goes out the window. And that's not the point of constructionism, because constructionism isn't trying to say what is true. It's a way of talking. It's a way of looking at things. And what it doesn't do is to eliminate any particular perspective. That is, it doesn't eliminate science, it doesn't eliminate religion, as those two traditions will tend to do, because each of them wants to declare truth on its side. <clears throat> it doesn't eliminate a tradition which we might call immoral. It asks another thing, how is that possible, and how could we relate to it? Constructionism invites a strong concern with multiplicity in the world and how it is that we can reconcile multiplicities. As I said earlier, constructionist ideas are debated throughout the world at this point, and one of those debates hangs on, and many people look at the future hanging on, how it is we can exist in the next 50 years in a world with multiple realities, multiple declarations of what is true, what is real, what is right, how can we cross-talk? How can we have a dialogue which will soften those borders? How can we take on alternative realities? And again, constructionist ideas begin to develop, <coughs> or at least open that way, by, say, by sort of saying that we should mutually recognize the possibilities inherent in various ways of life. And it's not a matter of which is going to be superior, it's a matter of attempting to develop forms of, of living together, new forms of coordination. That's another topic. I want to spend a few minutes <clears throat> talking a bit about the background <clears throat> of social construction in the last, last really 30, 40 years. I mean, you could trace constructionist ideas a lot further back in time, but most of the dialogues that we're involved with today come out of three different lines of argument. And it's interesting to, to, to be able to understand those <coughs> because each of them has a kind of a critical edge and each of them offers a, a sort of opening, a creative opening. And I'm not going to talk about these at length. You can go to um, books that I've written. One, Realities and Relationships, is a good one. An Invitation to Social Construction would be another, in which some of this <clears throat> is laid out in more detail. So just in, in, in brief, <clears throat> there's three different forms of argument. If you understand these arguments, no authority can stand. <clears throat> That is, they will bring down, they will undermine any kind of authority which says this view is superior. <clears throat> First argument, we'll call it critical theory argument. 
can trace it back. You know, Marx is questioning of the ideology of capitalism. You can bring it up into contemporary feminist critique of um, male-centered institutions. You could do gay and lesbian critique, uh, Hispanic critique, black. I mean, it's a critique of, that has been used by enormous numbers of minority groups to challenge what is called the dominant discourse. Major figure here, if you want a touchstone, would be Michel Foucault, French social theorist. <clears throat> and Foucault's best known for a, a kind of a phrase, knowledge power, knowledge slash power. Now, how does that go? It says, look, for any declaration of what is true, once you take hold of it, once it becomes true for you, it will begin to have power over you. You will become, in his terms, a, a sort of a docile body. You become its victim. Let me give you an example. We have, in the last hundred years, within, within psychology, psychiatry, developed a set of categories of mental illness. <clears throat> And we, these are looked at as the authoritative categories that are used in diagnosis. A book called the DSM uh, contains these categories. And we, insurance is based on ones having these categories. And drug companies are all too pleased to, to generate pharmaceuticals to cure people in these various categories. <clears throat> OK, but look, remember, mental illness, whatever, on all those terms, schizophrenia, depression, um, ADHD, and so on, are constructions. They're not required by the way anything is. They are constructions that we use to lay on it. And if you believe those constructions, if you accept the categories, they become ways of understanding yourself. We didn't have depression as a category of mental illness until almost mid-century of the 1900s, 1940s or so, depression got to be a category. Now we've got one in 10 people in the United States are said to be depressed, and probably within a lifetime, um, three people out of 10 will go into a depression, and antidepressants become a multi-billion dollar drug. So in a sense, we made up a category. We accepted it as being, yes, we have depression. I mean, no, we all have depression. I mean, everybody said, well, how do you feel today? I'm depressed. we just a common usage of the term. And antidepressants are almost over the counter at this point. Go to any doctor and you can get an antidepressant within probably a half hour. So that we have become, in some sense, victims of a category system. And all the more threatening because that category system continues to expand and expand and expand. So now there are about 300 different categories of mental illness, 300 different ways that professionals can call you mentally ill. Again, that reduction to mental illness of all the other possibilities for how it is we might understand someone who is somewhat strange, and how we might relate to them. So it's a be careful of the categories. Be careful of the constructions in which we live because they throttle us. <clears throat> so that's the critical edge. It says be always cautious of what you're crawling into as things get to be called, as you listen to anyone talking about what is the case, because there's always a value hook there. There's always a way of life implied. Now that's the critical edge. The better edge is to say, look, whatever we do in our lives, however it is we talk, is also going to carry values. And as we construct the world, we're going to create, if we are collaborative with other people, we're going to create realities, and we're going to live by those. So it says, you are not limited for those traditions that you can construct alternative ways of, of talking, which will carry alternative ways of acting, which will carry the future. 
So anything you do, whether it be in science, politics, or any other venture in day-to-day -day life in a family, carries with it the future in terms of values. Now that's the first argument. <clears throat> Second argument comes, it's a slight, it's totally different, comes out of literary theory. Um, the argument here is somewhat different. It says something like this. Look, the moment we want to describe something, we're going to, we, let's go back to Wittgenstein a moment, we're going to go into a certain kind of language game. We're going to go into rules of description. So whatever anything is, I'm going to have to use that set of rules. And that thing is not represented in the rules. For example, we have a, a language with nouns, all right? So we have language that names things. Now that's not neutral because nouns cut up the world. That is just to use nouns in our language. Cuts things into pieces. That chair, that table, that bottle, this person, that ceiling, that floor. Okay, so the very language we use is a, is a winnowing machine. It could be otherwise. What if your language for description, for example, were dance, and all you could do is to move? Likely it wouldn't be divisive. Likely it would be movement. Likely it would show a flow of this. There wouldn't be separations. There would be a kind of a continuity among whatever there is, as one moved about it. So every form of description that we use will assert its sort of reality over, it, over that which we want to describe. A poem will do different things to it than a song, than will a neutral language of science. <clears throat> now on the critical side it says there are no words which are necessarily authoritative and which we must necessarily take into account. So in that sense, it's critical of all authority, or at least it allows one uh, a way of questioning authority. On the more positive side, it says, hey, we're free to create. We're free to generate new languages. We're f we are free to use multiplicities of languages, of blending them together, using multimedia, and so on, in terms of our understanding of the world. So it's an invitation to a kind of creativity in terms of our forms of representation, our forms of accounting for things, our forms of describing ourselves or others. Third line of criticism or <clears throat> background, not critical theory, not literary theory, but social theory, and particularly social studies of science. <clears throat> Major figure here is Thomas Kuhn, whose work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, at one point uh, in the, roughly the 1970s, sold more books than the Christian Bible. Enormously important work. Now again, there's a lot to be said about that book and a lot about controversy over it, but take, let's take this point. And again, it's not an unfamiliar one at this time. <clears throat> but Kuhn argued, look, whatever scientists do is going to come out of the enclave in which they exist. That is, there is no independent individual or observer who simply goes in and makes a discovery. <clears throat> that that observer, a scientific observer, is part of a community <clears throat> and will use the traditions of that community to make that study. He called them paradigms. That paradigm might include the theories which are common in that community. It might include the methods of study. It might include the assumptions of what the world is made of, how to write about it, whether to use statistics, for example, or not. But that there is no study of the thing in itself. There is only study from standpoint, to go back to an earlier statement. We study from within paradigms. <clears throat> now the critical part of that is there is that look, there is nothing outside of paradigms of, of understanding. <clears throat> and all paradigms are limited. 
In that sense, there is no way of establishing a superior paradigm. <clears throat> You'd need another paradigm, in fact, to establish what was superior. That's the critical part, undermining the authority. The positive part is to suggest that <clears throat> if we are to create alternatives, if we are to expand the horizons of possibility, if we're to generate ways of crossing cultures, it will require some kind of collaborative effort. It's not a matter of us standing alone, not a matter of the independent mind. And we're not talking about the hero of Galileo here. We're talking about people in communities moving together to create the real, the possible, in different ways, as stances, as possibilities, not as the real, but a real. <clears throat> So you can begin to see these three lines of argument coming out of totally different traditions in the academy begin to converge at some point into basically the propositions that I laid out earlier as constructionist. Now let me finish up here by just saying what has come out of this so far? There's been this uh, sort of enormous mushrooming of, of new and rich forms of inquiry and ways of life. I mean, if you just look at what's happened in, let's say, the social sciences for a moment, what it's, to, it's to say, look, we can generate new theories, theories which try to bring things into the real as opposed to somehow reflecting them. Why not generate those theories, those ways of looking at the world, which will create the world for what, in ways that we would like it to be? It said, look, why not new methods of research? Why do we have methods of, of which require that I am neutral to you and remain distant from you? Why not an alternative methods? And thus we have handbooks of qualitative methods which have gone through three or four editions in the last 10 years simply with the new kinds of things people call methods of research. And if you look at therapy, the whole field of therapy, not the whole field, but vital new movements which look at therapy not as trying to get at what's wrong with the person and curing them, but looking at what's wrong as a construction in itself and asking whether we can't reconstruct. If a person is living a life which they feel in which they feel a failure and are depressed they feel because of that failure, <clears throat> is that a good story? Is it possible we could have another narrative that you could generate about that life? which would be more uplifting and which that person wouldn't feel that they were a failure. So therapy becomes then a matter of reconstruction. Uh, take organizations, organizational work, trying to organizational transformation. <clears throat> Whole new theories of the organization. Organizations as, let's say, conversation and what that means. <clears throat> um, practices of change, trying to bring people together in an organization trying to tra change, trade stories about what it is they really like about this organization and using those to spring uh, into the creation of the organization of the future. And using the positive core of the organization and saying, what could we create out of that? <clears throat> and new forms of organization spring to life. Uh, and work on dialogue and particularly um, uh, conflict reduction. Whole new ideas about how it is that we could talk across realities. Uh, emphasis, on, again, on stories. If I can tell you a story about the pain or suffering that I've experienced in my particular group as a result of something you've done, you can listen to that story in a way in which you can't listen to the diatribe and critique that I might otherwise uh, direct in your, uh, place in your direction. So a whole new challenge is about forms of dialogue which we might bring into play. How do we create them? How would they work? And so on. So in effect, there's a way in which constructionism is an honoring of all traditions, all traditions, allowing them a voice at the table, bringing them into dialogue, and out of that the hope that somehow together, somehow together, we could create whole new ways of life, whole new realities and possibilities which will allow us to sustain and enrich life for all people. That's a tall order, but it's worth living for. Thank you.